Good morning, everybody. My name is Miles Berry. I'm subject leader for ICT education at Roehampton University, training the next generation of outstanding teachers, which is such a lovely job to do. The previous 18 years, I worked in four different schools, uh, much of that time as an ICT coordinator, the last three years as a head teacher, hence the prematurely grey hair. I'm also chair of NACE, which is the ICT subject association. Anyhow, this is where I work, or actually this is where our vice chancellor works. I have a room made out of breeze blocks a little way off screen to the right there. Um, Roehampton, like more ancient institutions, is a collegiate University, we're made up of four colleges. I'm based in Froebel College, which is named after Friedrich Froebel, great German educator and pioneer of the notion of the kindergarten. Absolutely essential, you know, central to so much of what we do in terms of early years education. Here's a 19th century German painting of 19th century German kindergarten. Do you think it would pass its EYFS inspection? I'm not sure, you know, there's the, 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 yes, there is activity here, yes, there is learning taking place, but I'm not entirely sure that the grown-ups are actually sort of leading that learning. They've provided a rich, stimulating, interesting environment in which children are learning plenty of things. It's working now, that's great. Um, the other thing Froebel's well known for is producing these, these sets of blocks, so these, these things called the Froebel gifts. So before the age of sort of three or so, at sort of stages of children's development, you give them these lovely little presents, one of which is a collection of sort of cuboidal building blocks there, and let encourage the child to explore, to experiment, to discover, to put these things together in interesting ways. And the child learns so much about their environment, about the nature of things, about physics, about science, through that practical experience of playing with building blocks. Those of you who know Scratch know where we're heading in several slides' time. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright attended a Froebel kindergarten, and I think there's more than a passing resemblance between those sorts of early childhood experience and some of his the great American architecture later in life. So bear that in mind with the little bits of computing, little bits of ICT that we're doing with very young children. The word pedagogy or pedagogue needs a little bit of unpacking. Some people get sort of fairly, you know, fussy about this sort of thing and think that pedagogues are people who stand up at lecterns and tell people about things, much like what I'm doing now. But actually, it's a much more inclusive term than that. If you look at the, the etymology of the word, we have there from the ancient Greek, the slave who took children to and from school, to and from the place where learning happened, the person who took the child to the place they could learn. And of course, the word slave is one which we all can identify with now, these days. Okay, Is there an issue in terms of ICT pedagogy? Yes, we know that all of this stuff about curriculum, which Peter's explained so eloquently. What about the next thing? What about the way we teach this? Well, perhaps, you know, this is the Ofsted report to ICT in schools 28 to 11. They have serious concerns about the, not only what is being taught, but also much some concerns about how it's being taught commenting here that actually when they saw ICT being used elsewhere in the school, it was being used better than it was being used in ICT lessons. The pedagogy in other subjects from Ofsted point of view seemed in some schools to be better. Here's an example. This isn't an ICT lesson. This is not the sort of usual, let's do PowerPoint again because, you know, you clearly didn't learn enough over the previous 14 years of doing PowerPoint. This is a computing lesson, a programming lesson that they're talking about. I'll give you a moment to read that. Only a moment because we're pushed for time. Isn't that awful, though? I think we all realise that we could teach computing just as badly as many have taught ICT these previous years. Yeah? Getting the pedagogy right, doing the teaching bit better, I think it really does matter. And if we're going to do this well, let's... You know, the opportunity for a new subject to redefine the curriculum. Let's also go about redefining the, the pedagogy. Gentleman on the screen behind me, Piaget, great education theorist. I know somewhat discredited before Peter tries and interrupts there. But, you know, some really, really useful insights that what we're doing when we're learning is constructing our understanding of how the world around us works. And we do that through two experiences. The same is true when it comes to learning about computers. We are constructing our understanding of how the computers work, whether we like it or not, whether we do that explicitly. We still have this mental schema of how the machine in front of us, how that internet thing does what it does. And he says you have two ways of doing this. You have the assimilation stuff, which is, oh, yeah, I kind of know how it works. Yeah, that kind of makes sense in my current mental schema. And then every now and then, those wonderful aha moments, those moments of accommodation, as Piaget describes, it's where our mental model, our mental schema, has to change to take account of the new data that we're provided with. And those of you who do code, who here writes computer programs? That's pretty good. Okay, that's pretty good. You've had that experience, haven't you, of the machine doesn't do what you expected it to do, and suddenly, through that experience, your understanding of the technology changes. Or is that just me? 
Yeah, other people too? That's good. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, Peter says we mustn't talk about learning styles. Learning styles are tosh. He's almost certainly right. I'm going to talk about three learning styles. <laughs> These are three that I've kind of made up, so a doubly tosh as a result of that. I reckon um, when it comes to learning about technology, we, broadly speaking, have three ways of doing that. Some of us like to just play with the toys, please, and explore and experiment and stuff, stuff which Froebel would have re and Piaget would have recognised. Some of us do like to read the manuals. I'm old enough to remember when computers came with manuals um, to look at the instructions, look at the help files, this day and age to w watch the YouTube walkthroughs. And some of us like to have somebody there to talk to or to help us with these things stage by stage, step by step. I make my students, first lecture of the course, pick one of these three as their sort of preferred option. And the clever students, the ones who are going marked down as troublemakers, say, well, it depends. And of course it depends. But if I made you pick one of the three, which would you pick? Who here likes to play with the toys, please? Thank you very much. Who here likes to read the manual? Thank you. Some people are picking more than one. Who here likes to have somebody to talk to? Tech support helpline? Maybe not so much, but real person. <laughs> right. But isn't that interesting? And I think if you were to do the same thing with a group of the young people with whom you work, you'll find even more at this, let me play, let me explore, let me experiment. Nevertheless, how come so many of our ICT lessons are, could you have a look at this worksheet and follow the steps through? Or, no, 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 don't race ahead, I've not quite got to that bit yet. If you just wait, I'll show you the next thing to do. We don't necessarily, and we probably do, but you know, other people teaching ICT, <laughs> you know, don't really think in terms of so many of us, so many children, young people, actually just like to explore, to experiment. Isn't that something which we could build into our pedagogy? That's the same question to my student. 42% of them pick that sort of first category. I thought it would be higher than that, in all honesty. And these are some things which our new postgraduates say. Yeah, I've not really gained much from being sat down and taught how to use ICT. Prefer to experiment with it. Trial and error. Okay. And then this one. Isn't this lovely? The Raspberry Pi is still here. You know, <laughs> it's so hard to break a computer through incompetence. And with one of these, if you do break it, you know, the, the, you can fix almost every problem by just putting a new SD card in there. You know, it's 25 quid. No, 22 quid. Probably more on eBay still. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that sort of attitude is such an important one. So, yeah, um, we ask them to self-evaluate their skills, their knowledge, their understanding on five-point look at scale from novice through to expert. Skills they do pretty well. These have had, many of our new undergraduates have had 14 years of primary and secondary education. They've grown up with computers. If we believe in digital natives, Peter, don't object just yet, then they are digital natives. Many of our new students were born after the web was invented, yeah? They're younger than the World Wide Web. So it's not surprising that when it comes to skills, two-thirds of them across that range of skills, say competent, proficient, or expert, good for them. When we ask them about understanding, less than a quarter describe themselves as competent, proficient, or expert. And what's this? Over a third say, I have no understanding of how technology works. Something's got to change there, hasn't it? Yeah? We've done so much on the skills side of things. But perhaps one of the roles we can play is about developing children's understanding and people's understanding of how technology works. Interestingly, when you look at this against the learning stars thing, it does seem to make a difference. So those who like to explore do much better on this understanding score than those who like to sort of have that hand-held, -hand one-to-one support approach to it. You know, there's this, there is a significant difference there. What's that? A third of them. Um, as competent, proficient, or expert when it's exploring, 15% when it comes to, I like to have the support there. Now, I don't know which way causality goes. Do you think it's those who like to play get a better understanding, or is it those who are happy playing? Sorry, the other way around. Those who have the understanding are happier playing. Which way around do you think it goes? Play leads to understanding? Yeah. Understanding leads to play? Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, chicken and egg, very nice. I think you're probably right. Anybody recognize the gentleman with the beard on the screen? Seymour Patrick? Seymour Patrick, absolutely right. Who wrote a book on this, literally? No, 1980, Mindstorms came out with not only how children can learn to program by doing writing programs, by working with these floor turtles, but also how that leads to an understanding of how the world around them works. The whole computational thinking, you know, Papert was there with that. And his vision, his insight into learning, he worked with Piaget 
interestingly, is not, it's not enough just to explore, just to experiment, or just to talk to somebody, as Vygotsky would have argued. But you also have to make things for other people to see. The act of producing something to show to other people is where so much of the learning takes place. And I think those of you who do code or use digital media in a creative way will share that experience, that actually through making things for other people, that's how we learn to use this technology. That's how we learn to understand this technology. Um, so, yeah, this is what we call constructionism. Not time to read it. And, you know, did brilliant, brilliant work with that with young children, 1970 onwards. Um, and, of course, from this you get to the lifelong kindergarten group at MIT, Mitch Resnick's project and Scratch that they've developed with this cycle of look at the words in here about creating things, about playing about sharing things. You can see how that sort of worked out from what, pa what Papa did way, way back then. Um, so this is something which we do with our students. Our ICT specialists have to go and create an educational game inside Scratch. And this was one of the ones from a couple of years ago. We made it much more complicated since. Now, I'm not entirely comfortable about the maths pedagogy of I'm going to ask you a question. If you get it right, I'll ask you another maths question. But nevertheless, they're, getting, they're using Scratch and they're using it in a, in a way which relates, I think, directly to their professional learning. And okay, it's not necessarily elegant code, but they've had a go and have got the confidence of through building something, through making something. And this notion of creating educational games, again, Papa wrote the book or the paper on that. That this experience of creating, you know, there's the drill and practice is seriously limited stuff, but making the drill and practice program, that's much more interesting. This paper dates from 1971. Yeah? 12, 11 years, no, 41 years ago. How many of us are doing interesting things like that still? A minority, I fear. So moving on, um, okay, now you're allowed to object to the, the use of the word digital native in here. <laughs> okay, do you believe, who here believes in this notion of digital native? That those, you know, the, the young children, the young people with whom you're working think differently to how my, our generation do. Anybody? Okay, interesting. That's fine. There's a lot of people who take exception to this and say that, you know, it's, it's just arbitrary labels and it's, it's a myth. Nevertheless, some of the stuff which comes from this I think is helpful. So this is Prensky, when he characterises digital natives, says they like to learn this way. Um, you know, looking back to my own school days, I think I like to learn that way. And I'm not entirely sure, certain whether I count as a digital native, born the same year as the internet. Um, now, does that ring true of the people you work with in school? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, and Prensky's latest book says, if that's how they like to learn, learning style if you wish, then let's change our pedagogy to take account of that. What role does, at, what is our role if this is the sort of thing that they want to do? And he comes up with this notion of partnering pedagogies, that they do the things which they're very, very good at, and we do the things for them, which they're not so good at, like being critical and you know, challenging that and, ex and expecting it to be higher and higher quality all of the time, creating, asking the right questions, such an important thing, and I think something which we need to encourage teachers to do more and children to do more about asking questions, asking good questions and creating rigour, that word coming in again. Um, we have lovely little projects which are doing this so well. That's a good, has a real potential to change curriculum. ICT is a bit broken. I'm not going to spend time showing you videos which you can go and watch in your own time, but that notion of, okay, they do the things which appeal to them, which are exciting to them, and then we take them on from that to something which they wouldn't have done themselves. Six boxes on the board here. What I'm describing, or what I've, I've listed here, is some of the characteristics which the enthusiasts, the advocates, say you find with game-based learning. That if you play commercial off-the-shelf computer games in the classroom, you get these sorts of things. So when you're playing a commercial off-the-shelf computer game, you're very focused on your goal. There's an immediate interactivity, whatever you do with the joypad thing, the computer reacts in a certain way. You know how well you're doing pretty much all of the time. Your score's going up, money's going down, whatever. Um, there is that sense of progression that level three is harder than level one. It is. And, you know, Steve Johnson describes it as the dirty secret of computer gaming, really, really hard. You know, think of the typical primary school child. The hardest work that they're going to do may well be the computer games which they're choosing to do rather than the homework which you're setting. And I'm not just talking about geographers here. Um, and that once in a while you get that sort of chimney high sense of flow that time seems to fly by and you're so, because you're so absorbed in what you're doing. So that's what the folks say about 
game-based learning. Do you not think, though, those of you who put your hand up for, yeah, I do a bit of coding, that these things apply to computer programming too? That those of us who have that experience of, of writing software do find these things as part of that. So I think there are really strong parallels between some of the things which the enthusiasts say about playing computer games and what the computer science enthusiasts would say about the experience of programming there. Um, and why not? You know, why not? You know, which of these things do you not want to happen in your classroom, really? You know, finding something which, which ticks those boxes. You're putting your hand up or just scratching. OK, that's fine. OK, so James Paul Gee says, let's look at the way computer games are constructed and try and learn some lessons from that. You know, the video games industry are doing very, very well. They're selling all of these products to children, and these are really difficult things. What have they cottoned on to that we as educators perhaps haven't? He comes up with a list of 36 things, of which seven are up on the screen there, about these are the sorts of principles which are embodied in computer games that get people hooked, that get people learning things. I think it's possible to take at least these and say, we can see how we could do computer science that way too. Let's think about each of those things. And computer science education, perhaps, because of those quite close parallels between the experience, can also borrow some of those learning ideas, perhaps more easily than other parts of the curriculum, such as the literacy that he suggests. And you're seeing this sort of gamification with things like Code Academy. Who started Code Academy at the beginning of the year? Let's have those hands up, please, Code Academy people. Keep your hand up if you're still doing it. Okay, well done, you five. That's really good. Congratulations. Kudos, respect. And then you have Code Avengers, which is even more game-like than Code Academy. And, you know, yeah, by all means, go and use Code Academy with children. But if you want something which might be, I don't know, can I use the word dumbed down, more accessible, um, more motivating perhaps than the slightly gentler learning curve, then Code Avengers is, is another place to look. But it's borrowing a lot of the sort of uh, metaphors, language, ideas from the computer games thing and putting that into to something which might have more sort of socially worthwhile benefit than just being able to kill people lots. Um, okay, so uh, Stephen Downs, uh, George Siemens have this learning theory for the digital age, moving from uh, Papert's cons uh, sorry. Piaget's constructivism to Papert's constructionism, Downs and Siemens have this notion of connectivism, which says that at its heart, learning is about making connections, that you can't really say learning has happened unless your brain has changed, unless the, neuron, the connections between the neurons are stronger or there are more of them than when you started the lesson. But it's also about connecting ideas together, and I think that's something which perhaps we've not done enough of in ICT education, so let's try and get it right in computer science education. But yes, we want them to code, of course, but let's also try and let them make the connections between that, the experience of coding and the ideas of computer science and that sort of bigger picture stuff of computational thinking. And it's also about connecting the people together, and I think that's going to be really interesting. But because we have this whole interweb thingy to connect stuff together, we now have the opportunity for children to connect to one another other than just the 30 people who happen to share similar dates of birth and postcodes to them. And yeah, some the exciting stuff. And you've got all of this resource out there. So, you know, want to learn how to build a, a search engine? There's a free course from a couple of Stanford University professors you can watch, follow through, get some sort of certificate qualification thing at the end. I'm not going to let you watch that either. <laughs> that this network of people that you're connected to is such an important part of the learning process, as I say, not just the 30 people in your class anymore. The personal learning network takes us on to the learners becoming part of a community, which it is so much easier for them to be now than it ever was back in my school days, back in our school days, he says, looking around the room and making assumptions. That this stuff down here, we've done very, very well. Yeah? Learning as experience, learning as making meaning is something which we do well in schools, broadly speaking. Learning as practice, learning as the act of doing something, again, is something which we've done very, very well, most of the time, most schools. But there are other aspects of this, yeah? Part of this is starting to think like a computer scientist and starting to take on some aspects of the identity of coder. What is it you do? Well, I write software, yeah? At what point does, do, do you cease to be somebody who writes software and somebody who is a coder. And part of that, of course, is this notion of becoming part of a wider community of practice there. This is Etienne Wenger talking about learning as a social process in notions of communities of practice, which I think you can now 
make a reality for the children, the young people with whom you're working. It's my second year taking part in Young Rewired State. Young Rewired State. My name's Lawrence Dope. I'm back here at Rewired State because I've been here doing Young Rewired States for, well, since it started. And it's been an excellent opportunity to, in fact, my career might be down to it. Hi, I'm Alexander Hill. Um, I'm here because I came here for the first one two years ago. Um, I had a really great time. So what you have is groups of techie people from startup companies working with people who are enthusiasts from schools and doing interesting <coughs> things over two, three days of their summer holiday with big government data sets and becoming part of that wider community of practice rather than just the people who happen to be studying the subject with them. And so you've got the sort of ideas of workplace learning there. Look at the breakable toy stuff. This is um, Hoover and Osh and I talking about apprenticeship patterns for new software developers. They say, what are, the, what are the things that you do? What are the, the techniques, what are the approaches you can follow to become a better software developer? And you know, part of that is, you know, throw yourself in at the deep end. Don't be afraid of exposing your ignorance. Don't be afraid to nurture your passion and unleash your enthusiasm. But also, you know, work with the breakable toys. You know, play with this stuff again. Um, and this... Try not to. Uh, <laughs> Alan's starting to get worried now. <laughs> He's talking about it being breakable. Um, and so, you know, this is written in the, the format of a pattern language. Pattern language, go back to Christopher Alexander, talking about, you know, towns, broadly speaking, have the same problems to solve. And there are good ways to solve these problems. Similarly, software developers, or those who are becoming software developers, have the same problems that they need to solve. And so, what are the, the, the way they do that? And the same thing, of course, applies to, to writing code. And this pattern language stuff was taken on in you know, quite a serious way by some of the object-oriented crowd here, the so-called Gang of Four. But it's also something which we kind of do in our teaching, even if we don't explicitly recognize that. And so you know, the work here on the pedagogical patterns side, of what are the, the patterns that we use in our line of work? And what, which, what are the things which we can reuse? And if you start thinking about lesson plans in this sort of way, it simplifies the whole process. Oh yeah, this is the sort of problem I'm going to encounter during this lesson. This is an appropriate way of solving this. It it's, doesn't dispense with the creativity, but it sort of gives you a way of thinking about that. Which takes me on to, let's take some of the stuff which we label as computational thinking and think about how that applies to our job. Yeah? If we are wanting the children to start thinking in an algorithmic manner, what are the algorithms that we look for in our lesson? And I, I suggest that those of you who do write software have started to think about the world differently through that experience of writing code. And perhaps you start to think about your teaching differently as a result of that. And, you know, the, the sort of abstraction level stuff. We have that. You know, we can see where that fits into to our work. You know, we start with schemes of work, programs of study, start with programs of study, schemes of work, medium term plans, lesson plans, individual engagement. We have that sort of level of abstraction boundaries that we cross. And, you know, the further up the senior management or policy chain you get, the less interested you are in the detail. We don't need to know what's happening to individual electrons. We do want to know what the sort of functional requirements of the block of code is. And I think there are parallels that can be drawn there. If we had more time. <laughs> you know, who here is still teaching waterfall um, design methodologies? A-level computing teacher? A-level ICT teacher? You have to, because the exam board are going to examine that. Yeah? Um, you know, this is not... I mean, fine, if you want a big NHS database, this is the way which generally we've gone about that. But that didn't work so well, did it? <laughs> okay, you know, and I think this is what we've done with curriculum design in the past. You know, Secretary of State people should do more Latin, or you know, people should learn poetry, and then the great and the good go and design something, and then teachers go and implement that in their classroom. Oh yes, we do plenty of ver verification. Testing is something which we do quite big time, and occasionally we send out a service pack and say, okay, this is a way to sort of tweak what you've got there. So you know, that approach has, has served as, I was going to say, well, it's a good way of building cathedrals. You know, you have one great Brilliant, sort of lovely thing, design, designed for a, a noble um, purpose there. But there are other ways. And, you know, Eric Raymond talking about the cathedral, the alternative is the bazaar, where we each bring something of our own to this. And we take the best bits. And it evolves organically rather than be created by authority for one particular purpose. This serves the purpose of the people who are coming to the bazaar. And so I think there are parallels from that over to agile software development, which is kind of what I was hanging the talk on. I'm probably running out of time about now. Um, and this stuff is waterfall, yeah? The stuff in larger font here is the agile stuff. So think about how this stuff 
works in relation to teaching. Aren't we more interested in the individuals that we're working with and the interactions with those children than we are over the processes and tools of our job? Aren't we more interested in getting working knowledge there rather than comprehensive lesson plans? I do hope the recording doesn't go out to my Roehampton student, <laughs> students. Aren't we more interested in collaborating with our pupils, not so much customers, than over sort of negotiating the sort of learning compacts or whatever? And aren't we more interested in being agile, of being responsive to change, of dealing with the situations as they're presented to us in the classroom rather than sticking slavishly to our lesson plans. Of course, agile software development, there's a move on from there too, to this sort of craft of software, sorry, this, this notion of software craftsmanship. That yes, fine, working software, but well-crafted software. That working knowledge is fine, but let's aim for the best it can be, please. And yes, respond to change, but also make things better and better over time. Fine, focus on individuals and interactions, but also focus on the community there. And I think, again, this is a, an English thing. We focus so much on individuals achieving their potential that we don't think enough about the learning community within our classroom. And partnership matters perhaps more <coughs> even than collaboration itself. So, yeah, what about your plenaries as scrums? Um, Agile, you do this? <laughs> okay, you're doing all of this already. Okay, go get a coffee, Genevieve. <laughs> it's fine. But, you know, why not? Ask these questions in your plenaries. Why not run your end of lesson or your end of unit plenaries as sort of scrum meetings? And you know, don't digress beyond the three questions to discussion of problems or gossip. There's a thought. Okay. And it works the other way too, that you know, pair programming, really important, effective. Um, Agile development strategy, we do that a lot of the time in primary schools because we don't have enough computers <laughs> to go around. But you know, take the pair programming approach to that. If somebody's the, the driver, the other is the navigator, think about how the roles can work differently but together for that sort of two children sharing one computer between them. And you know, the paper advertised behind me sort of looks at it the other way. <sighs> Anybody? Yeah. Elephant in the room? What is the elephant in the room? Not Michael Gove. Good answer. <laughs> the elephant in the room for all of this, I'm afraid. And, you know, I hope you've enjoyed what I've talked about and think, yeah, that would be a lovely thing to do. But the elephant in the room is assessment. And if you, you know, it's fine saying, let's do collaborative projects and let's do, you know, <laughs> learner-led education. But if you've got a GCSE specification where they're not really encouraged to sort of collaborate when it comes to either the written paper or the controlled assessment, then... <laughs> There's a mismatch there. There are other ways of doing assessment, though. Um, and, you know, the, the badge idea is a really, really exciting one. That, you know, instead of saying you're at level six or eight, as Peter was expecting us all to, to, to aim for there, why not take those statements and look at each of those and say, okay, you've done that bit. Well done. That's ticked off, rather than waiting to see when we get all of those. And, you know, badge for that, badge for this, badge for the other. And then you get an armful of things at the end. Or a digital backpack of them. So this is Infernal Depart's work. I'm still not sure what his real name is. On Twitter, he's at Infernal Depart. So taking the badge idea and applying it to bits of the present ICT national curriculum and beyond. And, you know, the, the sort of hash digital studies crowd and looking at badges in a very big way. So great work using a soft copy <coughs> package. You get the badge from a code um, yeah, I'm a digital citizen. I'm digital creative. I'm not sure what you'd have to do to achieve those badges, but they look nice ones to wear. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Mozilla um, doing really exciting work about providing a way of doing this in a verifiable way. So you, if you claim that you've got a badge, somebody can check that you actually have got that badge. Um, and there are more important things than qualifications, says he working at a university. That when it comes to your place at a Russell Group University, when it comes to getting a job in the industry... GCSE ICT probably is not going to be what makes the difference for you, in all honesty. Even A-level computer science, may, you may well be up against everybody else on the list who's got A-level computer science. What's going to matter, I think, is the people with whom you've worked, that personal learning network beyond the classroom. So, you know, for instance, Young Rewired State projects would matter for that. Projects you've contributed to. So, you know, Google Summer of Code, which was for university students, Google Code in for high school students contributing to open source software development projects. That's going to look good on your CV slash UCAS application form, isn't it? And, you know, the, the portfolio of stuff you've done. So, you know, if you can teach yourself Objective-C, good luck with that. Then, you know, coding up those iPhone apps and getting so many hits from the iPhone store, that's going to look good 
when it comes to UCAS application form, probably more so than a GCSE computer, um, ICT. How do you get from Roehampton to the Guardian offices? Well, if by public transport, it's that line. If I want to get here from there, that's the way to do it, okay? London is an interesting place, though, and there are interesting things to explore between here and there. And if we keep thinking about lessons and curriculum in, we start here, we get there then we keep doing sorts of things which we've done. Move over to a more spatial metaphor rather than a temporal one and think of learning not as a journey to follow but as a landscape to explore. I think the whole host of other options open up. I've overrun by probably about half an hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for your patience. <laughs>